Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 5 starts now. And we're going to begin here at 5 with the weather as a line of severe storms march across southeast Michigan this afternoon. Now the warning started popping up and then they just kept coming. That's right. Let's get over to Brett Collar. We had that tornado warning up in the thumb. Are we out of the woods yet, Brett? Yeah, it looks like the strongest of the storms are out of here. But we're not completely done yet. There's this kind of weak line of showers that has developed kind of on the backside of these stronger storms. You can see those stronger storms are well off to the east of us. There is still a decent uh, downpour up in parts of Sandlack County, but it's this broken line of weak showers that we'll focus on right now. Again, it, it's just not nearly as strong as it was earlier. The atmosphere has been worked over by those stronger storms earlier, so there's not a lot of energy for these showers to tap into. So we're not expecting any strong to severe thunderstorms, but regardless, uh, there is still some rain out there, so we're not quite done yet. Moving to the east at about 40 miles per hour. So going to be in Lake Orion in just a short time here. Pontiac at 12 after the hour. Rochester Hills at about 20 after five. Like we mentioned, though, the atmosphere has been worked over. So the Storm Prediction Center has really downgraded the severe risk for us. We're basically out of it. That is still in effect to our south and east for the rest of tonight. Just those few showers are ending, but it's still pretty hot and muggy out there, and that's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. We'll talk about that in just a bit. Don't forget, you've got the local forecasters app right there in the palm of your hand. Anytime that storms develop, it's a great tool to have. We were using it a lot today. Just search WDIV weather in your app store. All right, uh, Brett, we'll be back to you We're here shortly. Our other top story here at five brand new information tonight in the shooting death of a 12 year old boy. The Wayne County prosecutor has just charged that boy's 13 year old cousin with one count of manslaughter. Let's get to Victor Williams. He's live for us. And Victor, you spoke to some neighbors who, who knew this family really well. Yeah, this is just a heartbreaking time for those neighbors, the family, and even the people in the community. Just a heartbreaking and tragic situation even for this 13 year old that's now being charged with manslaughter. My kids played with her kids. Um, it's very shocking, very, very heartbreaking. In a shocking turn of events, neighbors Rebecca and Chris Laney are processing the untimely death of 12 year old Kenyon Davis, allegedly shot and killed by his older 13 year old cousin. It's just too young, He's too, he was too young. I mean, we've got children of our own. And I just couldn't imagine if I was to lose one. I, uh, I don't think I could survive it. You know, I can't imagine what the parents are going through. We're told four kids were in the basement of the home on Bramble Tuesday night when the shooting happened. One of the adults of the home was upstairs sleeping, the other at work. The whole, the whole neighborhood came out. We were all just in shock and, and heartbroken. Very, it, there's no words to even describe it. The 13 year old cousin is accused of accidentally shooting Kenyon in the chest after pointing the gun at close range and then pulling the trigger for some type of skit. Through the investigation, another weapon was found inside the home along with the gun that killed Kenyon. And I don't think they meant to do it on purpose. It was a complete accident. Everybody in the neighborhood, all of our prayers and thoughts go out to the family, you know, and to the mom and dad. Right now, no adults are being arrested, but the 13 year old is once again being charged with one count of manslaughter. Two lives seemingly now forever changed. That's just a whole family torn apart, you know, and just a matter of moments. And, and on top of it, the loss of a son, you know, uh, it, it, would, it would kill me. And I'm told that this is a very loving family that unfortunately now has to deal with this situation. That 13 year old was given a bond worth $10,000. He's due back in court on August the 16th, but there is going to be a vigil for Kenyon tonight at 9 p.m. Victor Williams, Local 4. We will be following that as well. Victor, thank you. A Harper Woods man now facing charges in the death of his mother to go along with many other charges at the moment. 23 year old Jonathan Welch accused of stabbing 42 year old Flossie Bray. This happened July 10th during what turned out to be a barricaded situation at her home. Police say Bray escaped with a knife in her back looking for help. That's when police showed up. The standoff began, but earlier this week she died from her wounds. Welch already facing charges for killing his girlfriend and stepfather on that same day due back in court August 31st.
New at five, a report from Bloomberg says Ford Motor Company plans to cut as many as 8,000 jobs in the coming weeks. The move comes as the automaker tries to boost profits to fund its push into the EV market. We're told the cuts will come in the newly created Ford Blue unit that produces internal combustion engines. Plans have not been finalized as of yet. Ford says it doesn't comment on speculation. Governor Whitmer officially signs the final piece of the new state budget. She was joined by state and local leaders today at the Corner Ballpark in Corktown. Bipartisan agreement totaling $76 billion. They met for weeks developing the proposals. They announced the deal, of course, in late June, and now it's signed. The budget allocates $6 billion towards state and local roads. The rainy day fund has been boosted to an all-time high of $1.6 billion. When it's completed, their homes will sit right in the shadow of the Gordy Howe Bridge and all the traffic that comes along with it. But before it's done, the city spent millions uh, to retrofit the houses there with new windows and filtration systems to help deal with what's coming. Let's bring in Rod Maloney live in southwest Detroit. It is a, a no small project, Rod. Now, Devin, they spent about $6 million on it. And there are a lot of unusual components to this. So take a look at the construction here and the homes out here. And the Canadian government, believe it or not, is paying to keep this neighborhood viable and occupied by residents who want to be here. It is an odd juxtaposition. Heavy equipment working within feet of a home's front door. But if you look a little more closely, you'll notice the bright white of new windows all around. The city rehabbing southwest Detroit homes to help residents comfortably fend off the dust and noise caused by the bridge construction. Mayor Mike Duggan saying, This is a good neighborhood, and we did not want people moving out uh, because of the new bridge. And so we negotiated from the Canadian government uh, $45 million. On the south side of I-75, people had to vacate their existing homes and with assistance move elsewhere. But today the mayor toured a north side home, sporting not one, but two new air conditioner and furnace units, new insulation, upgraded electrical, and new insulated windows. Homeowner Gerald Romero, who's lived here for 11 years, told us that when they first came to him with this offer last year, he wasn't so sure about it, but... You know, with all the work that was going on and just the traffic alone, uh, you know, my bed is in the upstairs and it would shake. So now his aging home is cool and quiet and will stay that way when the bridge eventually opens. No surprise, considering they sunk nearly $60,000 into it. He's loving raising his nine-year-old daughter, Alicia, here. I love the community. This neighborhood's a beacon for the rest of the city. This neighborhood's going to be strong for years to come because of the improvements we made to the homes. Well, so far they've completed 174 homes in the Bridging Neighborhoods Program, that's what they're calling it, and they're averaging about $35,000 per improvement on homes, just like the one behind me here. Back to you. Well, we heard him talking about his bedroom shaking. Rock, can you give us an idea of how close these homes are to the new entryway of the, this new bridge? Right. Well, all of these homes rest within 300 feet of the construction yeah. out here, and they're going to be that way when they get the bridge finished. Yeah. You got it. All right, Rob. Well, soaring temperatures hitting the U.S. this week. People across the country doing a lot of things to try to beat the heat. Indeed, roughly 141 million people were forecast to experience highs above 90 degrees this week with excessive heat warnings and heat advisories in effect for 28 states. Some areas experiencing power outages, making staying inside with no A.C. unbearable. Miserably hot. I thought I had at least a day in me. I don't know if I'll make it tonight. At nighttime, we can sleep in there until we can't breathe anymore, and then we have to go outside. Extreme heat waves broke longstanding temperature records in 10 locations between Texas and Oklahoma on Tuesday alone. Sweltering temperatures around the world. Today, President Biden announced a series of executive actions taking aim at climate change. It comes as the push for legislation is stalled right now in the U.S. Senate. Susan McGinnis in Washington with more. Susan. President Biden today pointing to 100 million Americans under a heat alert, saying climate change is an emergency, and if Congress won't act, he will. As coast-to-coast -coast heat waves bake Americans in record temperatures, I don't have central aisle. Without a doubt, it is a life and death situation. President Biden today unveiling new actions to battle what he calls a climate crisis. We need to act. We just 
Take a look around. After Congress stonewalled his climate agenda, the president yeah. vowing if Congress won't act, yes. he will through executive action. As president, I have a responsibility to act with urgency and resolve when our nation faces clear and present danger. His initiatives would provide billions in funding for communities facing extreme heat, widen assistance to low-income Americans, including air conditioners and cooling centers, and propose new wind energy areas in the Gulf of Mexico. The president stopping short of declaring a climate emergency, which would unleash federal resources. Republican leadership blaming high gas prices on Biden administration energy policies. They're having trouble getting enough senators to agree to make the most reliable and abundant forms of American energy more expensive for working Americans. Republicans also skeptical of another White House goal, that half of all vehicles on the market be electric by 2030, along with a modernized power grid. The president also announcing new support for offshore wind. This administration lacks a coherent policy on climate. Period. End of story. The White House says the moves will create jobs, boost the economy, and pave the way to a clean energy future. The president says we will see some of these actions roll out in the next few weeks. In Washington, Susan McGinnis, Local 4. All right, Susan, president, by the way, making that announcement as he toured a former coal power plant in Massachusetts.